Hello, my name is Luther Obrock, and I am joined by my co-presenters, Marika Sardar and Justine Dillon, in exploring the role of textiles in the history of codices from Kashmir. Marika Sardar is a curator at the Aga Khan Museum with a specialty in Islamic art from South Asia. She's a specialist in the arts of the Deccan, but joins the panel here today to provide perspectives on the continuity of binding practices in Kashmir between Sanskrit, Persian, and Arabic language manuscripts. Jasdeep Singh Dillon has been a book and paper conservator at the Oxford Conservation Consortium since 2017. In addition to working at the consortium, he takes a deep interest in the history of South Asian manuscripts and printed books, especially those originating from the Sikh tradition. As part of this, he helps run a charitable organization called the Poti Seva for the conservation of Sikh religious books and manuscripts. As well as documenting the history of the Sikh Codex, he's especially interested in the history of papermaking, and this has led him to study for a PhD at SOAS, the University of London. I, for my part, am trained as a Sanskritist and am deeply interested in the cultural history of Kashmir. And I was drawn to this project by Alexandra Gillespie and Jessica Lockhart, who invited me to come take a look at a manuscript that had been preserved in the Fisher Manuscript Library at the University of Toronto. From this fateful encounter, my own research and research interests has been uh, has shifted to looking at material uh, uh, material changes as well in the history of the literary tradition of Kashmir. The book that they invited me to see is the Fisher uh, manuscript, which was listed in the manuscript, uh, it listed in the catalog as a Bhavagad Gita manuscript. Whereas in reality, it was a miscellany, an illuminated miscellany containing not only the Bhavagad Gita, but many other ritual and philosophical texts bound together. Now, in terms of the date, we put 19th century here in, um, uh, in this slide as a kind of last possible date for this. We're not entirely sure about the dates of, uh, manus uh, of manuscripts. Uh, the textiles have been tentatively dated to the 18th or 19th century by Rosemary Krill, although some of the uh, scribal, uh, um, uh, scribal idioms may be slightly earlier. So it's 19th century probably at the latest. And in terms of dating manuscripts from South Asia, it's very difficult to come up with exact dates. So throughout this presentation, we should put a circa in front of most of the dates, uh, except for perhaps the uh, Lhasa Codex, which we will talk about later, which was very definitively dated in the, um, in the manuscript itself. Now, um, beyond the contents of the text, the construction des deserves, uh, the construction of the Fisher manuscript also deserves to be further in uh, investi uh, investigated. We can see from the script that it's written in Sharda, which is a particular, a particular regional script used in Kashmir. It also contains illuminations, finely done illuminations uh, of Hindu deities. For instance, we see on the left here, the demon King Ravana being slain by the hero Rama, along with his brother and his monkey ally, Hanuman. Um, yet we can also see in, this, in these pages, uh, a, a certain source of Islamic page layouts, including the borders uh, that we tend to see in Islamic paper manuscripts. So, in order to understand all of the complex uh, uh, ideas that are going on, uh, that are being shown within this manuscript, I'm going to briefly rehearse the history of the Codex form in Kashmir and then pass it over to Jasdeep and Marika for a more in-depth discussion of particular cases. Now, Kashmir itself is a mountainous valley in the Himalayas that was the center of Sanskrit learning from at least the mini middle of the first millennium. We can see in this map, uh, the Kashmir Valley itself is circled, and we can see that it is bordered uh, on the east by the Tibetan Plateau, on the south by the plains of North India, and to the north and west by Central Asia and Afghanistan. <clears throat> from early times, it was deeply imbricated in uh, not just trade routes, but intellectual routes. And I'm putting up here the map of the journeys of a Tibet or of a Korean monk named Hiecho, who famously traveled throughout the Buddhist world of the, uh, of the eighth century. 
And one of the main nodes, one of the main places that he stopped was the Kashmir Valley. This was because this was a center of learning uh, and uh, for in Buddhist culture, uh, but it was also uh, connected to other places in Central and South Asia. Although it was an important node on, uh, on, on trade and intellectual routes, it also developed its own particular um, uh, uh, intellectual and material culture. In terms of material culture and manuscripts, one of the most striking um, uh, qualities of, of literary culture uh, and material culture from Kashmir is the use of birch bark. Um, given that it, it is climactically different from the plains of Northern India where manuscripts tended to be written on palm leaves, um, I, a separate tradition of writing code, uh, writing on birch bark developed in Kashmir and the areas surrounding. The first example of using birch bark for writing is uh, from Buddhist manuscripts um, Gantara, uh, from the Gantara region. Um, and these tended to be written as scrolls. Now, because we're not, there's a very interesting story to be told here about the transition from writing on birch bark scrolls to birch bark manuscripts which uh, Justine will talk about a bit at, towards the end of the presentation, but I'm going to leave aside here this interesting problem and focus more on the appearance of the codex as a form in Kashmir. Uh, to my knowledge, the earliest example of an intact binding comes from a complete codex that is housed in the Lhasa Museum. It is very well preserved and um, we know that it was dated very precisely to October 21st, sorry, October 23rd, 1054 CE. Uh, the sponsor of this artifact is styled as a follower of the way of mantras, so a tantric priest in the Buddhist tradition, and he's an acharya called Ratna Sri Bhadra. Um, and from this manuscript, I think we can begin to trace out uh, the rest of the history of uh, uh, of not only Kashmir, uh, not only manuscripts in Kashmir, but Kashmir itself. Um, we know from this manuscript that it was preserved in Tibet and also from various Tibetan inscriptions that we see uh, written uh, in the book itself that it, it traveled out of the Kashmir Valley and was used in Tibet as part of a sort of uh, 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 a portable codex culture. And we see in Kashmir itself, the codex became an important it became important and was even imbricated in the ideas the tantric ideas that went along with um with the development of uh, tantric religious practices and here i'm going to quote from uh from a text that was translated by uh the oxford uh, professor of sanskrit uh, alexis sanderson uh talking about the tantric system called the krama O you who have mastered the Krama, know that its tightly bound five hood knot is the power embodied in the five sense faculties, and its two encircling rings are waking and dreaming. Learn in brief the nature of its two boards. The outgoing breath with its seven flames is held to be the upper, and the lower has the form of the ingoing. So what he's talking about here is the way in which tantric uh, 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 liberation and tantric practice is imagined as the opening of a codex book. And I think this is something that needs to be investigated further. But we can see that the codex form was already uh, permeated the imagination of uh, uh, Kashmiri tantric writers. In terms of the political and social history of Kashmir, this starting in the second millennium, we see uh, many important changes in the uh, political structure of the valley. So uh, we have the establishment of the Lohara dynasty uh, in 1003. Um, and this was going to be the last Hindu dynasty of the valley until the solidification or uh, well, until Dogar rule um, in the 19th century. In 1321, we have the establishment of the Shamiri Sultanate. And the Shamiri Sultanate is interesting in that it, it in many ways was a coalition forged through different sorts of alliances, matrimonial and otherwise, between Central Asian Muslim, Central Asian Muslims, Ladakhi Buddhists, and, uh, and Kashmiri Hindus. And uh, although it was uh, 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 religiously Muslim, it 
charted its own course for over two centuries. In 1586, Kashmir was annexed by the Mughals and became part of the empire of Akbar. And in this, it, it slowly became part of larger structures and flows of materials, goods, and ideas that we'll see later on in, when Marika talks about uh, the uh, Islamic manuscripts that come from Kashmir. Our story of textiles in Kashmiri manuscripts begins with the early extant codex of this region, described as the Lhasa Codex. As well as being the earliest known example of a Kashmiri codex binding, the Lhasa manuscript is even more significant that it bears the same typical attributes of Kashmiri birch bark codices made six or more centuries later. Discussing the attributes of the Kashmiri codex might not seem especially relevant to the topic of this workshop, namely textiles in books. Yet if we see the sewing structure of a codex as a technological innovation originating from the manufacture of textiles, then it becomes important to explore this further. In his study of the early codex, Georgios Budalis showed how loop linking, a very ancient form of textile production, was actually the origin of the codex binding structure, whilst the end bands of manuscripts were derived from techniques used to finish the edges of textiles. How then did the attributes of Kashmiri codices relate to this? Firstly, all of the Kashmiri birch bark codices I have seen physically or digitally have been sewn using the same unsupported loop linking method with a thick thread on two sewing stations. This is not specifically visible on the Lhasa codex, but it is likely to be sewn in this way because all the other codices which we've studied have been sewn in the same manner. Birch bark codices consistently also have a textile spine lining, which is sometimes used to line the inside, the entire inside of the covers. The textiles observed for this component are consistently plain and are used for a structural purpose only. It's not specifically visible on the few images we have of the Lhasa Codex, but it is likely that this is also the case. The most visible feature of the Kashmiri Birch bark Codex is possibly the unique end band structure, which Although the image doesn't show it um, in close up, there are other images um, which um, have been posted online as Luther has described by various bloggers in which the actual end band can be seen much more clearly than you can see from this specific image. So it definitely exists there. Now, whereas end band structures in other bookbinding traditions seem to derive from textile finishing techniques, the Kashmiri end band possibly seems to derive more from leatherworking techniques. This diagram shows the structure in more detail. The image on the left shows the primary sewing, which consists of helical loops going into each gathering. These loops hold down a wooden core, which is uh, formed of a round cylindrical shape. I should add here that the wooden core itself may be wrapped in leather, held in position by an additional length of tightly wound cord. This is something which I only found out after seeing this image of a manuscript which underwent conservation treatment in the British Library, which had an exposed end band core due to the damage which had occurred over time. So what you see here is actually the exposed um, end band core. And on top of this, the leather, which was originally here, has um, worn away over time due to damage. As well as securing this wooden core, the primary sewing helps to attach a textile spine lining onto the backs of the gatherings, the textile which you see here. Whilst this primary sewing structure is found in many binding structures originating from the Eastern Mediterranean, the secondary component is particularly distinct. Saddle stitching, um, which is the technique used for this um, secondary component, is a technique used in Northern European bindings of the 15th century. But the Kashmiri binders had a particular style of folding and creasing the leather to form a recognizable head cap. Its presence on a binding, which potentially dates to the 10th century, suggests that by this period, this binding structure was mature and well established. This is significant because it suggests that the codex tradition in Kashmir was already well developed and mature well before the period when Muslim political power was established. All the codices I have observed include a four edge flap. So going back to the Lhasa codex seen here, 
And they also have evidence of a loop and toggle fastening mechanism. The loop and the, what you see here is part of this fastening mechanism, just where the hand is. The Lhasa Codex has a particularly intact fastening mechanism, as you can see. And this again suggests a possible connection with wider leather working techniques. The covers of the Lhasa Codex, as with other Kashmiri birch bark codices, seem to be made from a thick, limp leather, which has no boards as such, although some other examples seen elsewhere have internal leather stiffeners. I observed this typical combination of attributes in almost all the birch bark codices I've been able to study. The consistency of these attributes points to the existence of a defined binding type, which was already part of a mature tradition by the 10th, by the 10th sorry, 11th century, I should say. How and when did the technology of the codex reach the Kashmir Valley? Which cultural groups were involved in transmitting the codex technology to Kashmir? How did it evolve into a distinct and recognizable tradition? What was its relationship to the Islamic tradition of codex production? These are, codex, these are questions which require the consideration of possibilities which have not yet been fully explored in scholarship. Let's explore the attributes of Kashmiri birch bark bindings further using MS Stein or D74, a manuscript from the Brodkin collection dated to the 16th or 17th century. This manuscript contains a commentary on Kalidasa, the famous Sanskrit poet. It was made around six centuries after the Lhasa Codex. So this manuscript dates from a period when Kashmir had been under Muslim administration for two centuries. The binding appears very similar to the construction of the Lhasa Codex. For example, it has the same distinct end band construction with primary sewing and a secondary saddle stitch component stitched through the head cap leather. The end band's primary sewing is sewn through a wide plain cotton textile which extends onto the inside of the cover. As with the Lhasa Codex, it has a thick limp leather cover with a forage flap and remnants of an original fastening mechanism, which you can see here. You can also see the small decorative stamps, which are used in repetition across the cover, and this stamping also extends onto the spine area. So overall, this manuscript binding helps to further support the view the Kashmiri codex tradition was mature and perhaps somewhat conservative in nature, because despite the expansion of Muslim political power in this region, the binding tradition continued to exist in a almost unchanged form through the 16th and 17th centuries. This image shows a scaled down simplified book model based mainly on MS Stein Audi 74. I've shown it here so you can have an idea what this codex could have looked like when it was in a far less damaged state. This next slide shows two further examples to give you an idea of how developed this codex tradition actually was. The manuscript on the left, MS Stein or D79, has a particularly beautiful cover decorated with a range of small stamps used in repetition. It almost seems the binders of Kashmiri birch bark codices originated from earlier leather working traditions Perhaps they were makers of shoes, bags, and other such objects. The example on the right is from Williams College, and although heavily damaged, it does have a very intact end band, which clearly follows the established Kashmiri end band structure. From the 17th to the 19th century, we see the Kashmiri Codex tradition develop hybridized forms and structures. The example on the left shows the cover of a paper manuscript, which uses thick, limp leather but it's decorated using corner and center stamps, <clears throat> a design which would have been derived from the Persian eight book traditions. The end band shown in the inset, images, inset image is also a hybrid structure because the damaged head cap shows it has a twine secondary sewing underneath the leather, which again derived from the Islamic tradition. <clears throat> It's interesting that this Islam kit feature is hidden below a head cap, which is stitched over it according to the Kashmiri tradition. It's quite fascinating to see this. The example on the right shows a 19th century birch bark um, codex, which is, <clears throat> which not only uses the ancient material of birch bark, but also employs the same binding structure, which seems to be consistent with the early examples I've just described. By this period, Kashmiri was producing large quantities of manuscripts built in accordance with the wider Islamic tradition. 
If the birch bark codex structure continued to survive, this seems to suggest this was a relatively conservative tradition which survived amongst a social circle of connoisseurs who valued this distinct appearance and handling characteristics. By this period, Kashmir was a major producer of Persian and Arabic manuscripts written by both Hindu and Muslim scribes. Kashmir began to produce large numbers of manuscripts which were used locally and also exported to surrounding regions. Our next case study is MS1106 from the Fisher Library, University of Toronto. MS1106 is a Hindu miscellany, as Luther described earlier, which includes the Bhagavad Gita. Now, whilst the contents of the manuscript are clearly Sanskritic or Hindu in origin, the actual structure and the page form well are more in line with the Islamic tradition. It's written in the Kashmiri Sharda script, which, which strongly suggests it was made to be used within the Kashmiri Hindu community. Now it's immediately evident that the binding is unlike those seen by spark codices. Although written in the Sharda script, it has none of the structural features seen in Kashmiri by spark codices. Instead, it shows more features drawn from the Islamic tradition. For example, let's take the end bounds here. Although they're damaged, they are clearly constructed using the same method as was used most commonly in Persian and Arabic speaking areas. You can still see the evidence of the chevron pattern made by the secondary twined threads. If we consider the wider historical processes which had taken place by the 19th century, Kashmir had become an integral area in the Islamic cultural world. The various forms of Islam had become the most widely followed religion in Kashmir, and literate Hindu priestly families had mastered the Persian language. The choice of binding structure therefore reflects this wider cultural shift. Now let's look at the textiles. You cover the boards of the manuscript. The outer plain textile is a protective overcovering designed to protect the inner decorated textile. Whilst the decorated textile is very beautiful, it was actually not produced in Kashmir at all. Rosemary Quill from the Victoria and Albert Museum identified it for us as a satin weave textile made from a mixture of cotton and silk threads. Such textiles were produced mainly in the Gujarat region, located much further south. The fact that a plain textile was used to cover over the decorative textile suggests that for at least one owner, dec the decoration of the textile below was not something that had to be shown off and displayed. It's also interesting that the decorative textile was imported. Kashmir does, of course, have a long history of its own, producing woolen and te silk textiles, particularly in the form of shawls. Now, studying manuscripts to see this tradition of shawl, to see how this tradition of shawl manufacture affected book production would be very fascinating. For example, you could identify examples of bindings covered in woolen fabrics. It would also be interesting to explore how the decorative layouts of shawls were possibly applied to book bindings to design the decorative layout <clears throat> on the boards. This is a separate topic in itself, which warrants an extensive PhD level study. I'll now hand over to Marika. We'll talk a little bit now, a little bit about the other types of manuscript traditions which were going on in the Kashmir region, parallel to the birch bark traditions and the production of manuscripts from a more Sanskritic context. So at this point, both Luther and Jasdeep has have pointed out the various features of this particular manuscript that connect it to Islamic traditions. Um, that, you know, it contains uh, decorative elements that was now part of a common visual language across Kashmir for all manuscripts being made despite the contents. So when we look to contemporary Arabic and Persian language manuscripts, we see further connections across these traditions. This takes us into an area less studied within uh, the field of South Asian art, while highlighted in a few key publications there isn't a huge amount of scholarship into Kashmiri manuscripts in Persian and Arabic, and certainly not their bindings. For certain, the use of textiles isn't a phenomenon that's been remarked um, in the way that it has for the period just described by Jasdeep. However, an initial survey taking us into the 18th and early 19th centuries does show 
that there is a tradition of using textiles in the binding of Arabic and Persian language manuscripts. Uh, here we'll be focusing on things in the collection of the Metropolitan and Aga Khan museums. Um, and yet simultaneously, we should note that uh, manuscripts with more traditionally Islamic, quote unquote, uh, style binding were also being produced, as our examples will show. So if we look at this Quran, we see some fe features that place it within the canon of typically Kashmiri production. It has illumination in two tones of gold with a predominance of blue. Um, and this is all arranged within a broad frame uh, that surrounds the text panels. This is overlaid by protruding lobed arch-like interlacings that extend into the margins in the middle of each page and undulating motifs that fill the corners. This kind of double page illumination surrounds the beginning of certain chapters of the Quran and divides the text into seven sections, which facilitates the reading of the entire text over the course of a week. This is found in other parts of the Islamic world, but is a feature in particular that distinguishes Kashmiri um, production. Also typical of Kashmiri Qurans are certain illuminated motifs. In particular, an, a floral form known as a bote that is a feature of many Kashmiri decorative arts, uh, most especially textiles. In this case, the gold motif surrounds the letter Ayn, which marks the end of certain sections of each chapter known as Ruku. And I should note that we see this type of decoration in other kinds of Kashmiri manuscripts, such as this Sikh religious text that has both the type of illumination and golden motifs that we've just observed in the Quran. The binding of the Quran is also typically Kashmiri in that it is leather, with foredge and envelope flaps and lined with a textile. In this case, Rosemary Krill has identified it quite interestingly as possibly 19th century British and perhaps wool. She also pointed out a more decorative textile that can just be glimpsed beneath the plain red uh, wool that we were looking at. However, we couldn't see enough of it to identify it and obviously she wasn't able to examine this piece in person. We see the continuity of Kashmiri binding traditions in this example uh, as well. It's a rather battered copy of uh, the Persian epic of the Shahnameh. Um, and it's been dated to the second half of the 18th century and attributed to Kashmir primarily on the basis of its paintings. These paintings and the rather indifferent calligraphy um, compare closely to a sizable group of Shahnameh manuscripts being produced in Kashmir at this time. Something created for general consumption in the made to order uh, system described by the early 19th century traveler, Victor Jacquemont. Now this manuscript was recorded in our database as having no binding. Uh, and in this moment when we can't easily access our collections, we might never known of its co connections to wider trends in Kashmir if I hadn't had the chance to uh, see it in person. Uh, we briefly opened up here in Toronto a couple weeks ago and I was able to get into the museum and had the nice surprise of finding uh, traces of a textile, in fact, on this manuscript. Again, as identified by Rosemary Krill, this is a 19th century block printed cotton, most probably from Rajasthan. She described it as quite utilitarian, perhaps once looking like this example from the V&A collection in its original state. So uh, Jasdeep, if you don't mind, would you be able to speak to how this manuscript was bound and how the textile might have uh, functioned in this construction? Yes, so um, whilst we don't have the original boards, um, unfortunately, with this manuscript, the structural components which are visible do point to a binding structure which was fully in line with the wider Islamic tradition. The two station link sewing is visible on the exposed areas of the spine where the spine lining has come away, and the end bands are identical to those seen in the wider Islamic tradition. <clears throat> 
The choice of purple and blue for the N-bands is also worth noting since these colors can be seen on the N-bands of large numbers of Persian manuscripts. Perhaps these types of Shahnameh were, were possibly intended to appear visibly Persian. It's fascinating to think that at the same time as some Kashmiri scribes were producing this Shahnameh, there were also other Kashmiri groups producing the more archaic and traditional looking birch bark codices with limp leather covers, fastenings, and saddle stitch end bands. Clearly, Kashmir was a complex society where ancient, locally grounded forms of manuscript production lived on alongside newer forms, which seemed to be geared more towards an export market. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so then just to conclude, I wanted to briefly show two manuscripts demonstrating uh, what Joseph has been describing, that other types of bindings continued more um, archetypally Islamic forms, such as lacquer and leather with no trace of a textile lining. Uh, in this regard, an example would be this copy of the Delilah Khirat, uh, the text of which is a set of prayers in Arabic. It has the kind of illumination that I think we can all now uh, recognize as typically Kashmiri across these double pages at specific intervals in the text, as well as the kind of motifs often found in the margins. But its binding is lacquered on the exterior and the interior is colored paper with gilding with no trace of a textile underneath. Another example might be this Quran, uh, divided into seven sections with double pages of illumination and other features that place it within local traditions. But its cover is the stamped and gilded leather, both interior and exterior, with aspects of other Islamic Quranic bindings, but uh, some connections, as Joseph has pointed to, uh, to European decorative conventions, especially on the spine. For this period, then, it appears that the textiles and bindings serves a structural rather than a decorative or a symbolic function. This was not a universal practice, which may indicate that binders simply carried out uh, the traditions in which they had been trained, binding the books as they knew how, regardless of the contents of the text. And interestingly, although we know of Kashmir's preeminence as a producer of the finest textiles, and its association with sophisticated weaving techniques for several centuries at this point, uh, the textiles we have observed in these bindings uh, have been imported from elsewhere in the subcontinent or perhaps even from Britain, which at this time was flooding the Indian markets with its own textile products. They were coarsely produced, perhaps scraps of cloth that had outlived their useful purpose elsewhere and were inserted here in the memory of a long-standing tradition rather than out of respect for their material qualities. And now I will pass back to you, Jasdeep and Luther, for a discussion of our findings on Kashmir as a whole. Before offering any concluding thoughts or thoughts for the future, I just want to again underline how um, challenging and difficult it has been to, to study um, Kashmiri codices and in general the codex, the codex tradition of South Asia because it's a very um, diverse tradition where there were some scribes who would um, include colophon, other scribes didn't. And there is, there, by and large, there is a vast majority of manuscripts which don't have colophon. And many of the examples we've discussed, many of the case studies included in our presentation um, have been given very tentative dates, which um, are definitely open to reassessment and, and review. So just want to open up by saying that. But thinking, thinking about the Kashmiri tradition overall, there are some important concluding thoughts which do emerge. So the consistent attributes of Kashmiri birch bark codices point towards a well-formed manuscript culture which survived centuries of major political and cultural change. The Codex in South Asia has often been seen as an innovation which is brought to the region by Islamic cultural influence. Yet, in the case of the Kashmir Valley, it was only in the 14th century that Muslim political power was established. The existence of a relatively mature culture of Codex production four centuries before this point can be interpreted and explained in a few different ways. One explanation is that Islamic cultural influence was actually strong enough to shape Kashmiri manuscript culture centuries before the establishment of formal political power. 
But there are still some structural differences which um, require further investigation and, don't, and can't be explained easily in this way. Particularly the distinct saddle stitch end band, which was preserved as a structural feature over many centuries. It continued to be a preferred feature amongst some Hindu scribal groups up until the 19th century, even though by this period, Kashmiri manuscripts of Hindu and Muslim texts were basically structured and styled in line with the wider Islamic tradition. Another explanation is that perhaps there were a variety of structures which were actually in use in 10th century Islamic manuscripts and the Kashmiri birch bark tradition preserved a structure which became extinct or less well known in the wider Islamic world due to the growing dominant, do, dominance of the more archetypal Islamic binding. This is an interesting possibility and perhaps we need to compare Kashmiri birch bark codices with other Islamic manuscript cultures, particularly those from other parts of Central, Central Asia. There is also another possibility that is worth exploring. Perhaps the codex was adopted in Kashmir as a result of influence from earlier Manichaean and Christian groups who were active across the Central Asian Silk Road and active in the Indus River Basin before the establishment of Muslim political power in the region. Now, what is the evidence for this? One, there is epigraphic and textual evidence of Manichaean and Christian activity, particularly in the Gilgit Ladakh region, which neighbors with the Kashmir Valley. In a study carried out in 1983 by Geza Urai, it was seen that amongst the stone inscriptions left by travelers, there are some examples of Christian crosses which can be found. Secondly, there is textual evidence for a Christian presence in the Tibet region, which Kashmir borders with on the east. This is again discussed in further detail by Geza Urai. These Christian groups would have probably possessed codices and they may well have stopped in the Kashmir Valley or even established a brief presence there, which is now more or less forgotten. Perhaps this also explains the presence of codex manuscripts in Tibet, which are known from the ninth century onwards. These specifically have been discussed and documented in more detail by Jean-Pierre Draga and also discussed more recently by Agnieszka Helman Wajny. Thirdly, Kashmir was known to be an important seat of learning for Buddhist monks who traveled south from the Tarim Basin area where Manichaean and Buddhist codices dating roughly from the 8th to the 11th century have been excavated as part of the Dunhuang cave complex excavations. If the codex structure was being used by Manichaeans and Buddhists in Dunhuang in this period, then it is quite logical to believe that Kashmir was also familiar with the structure too, due to its interactions with the same cultural groups. I would like to finish by saying that Kashmir has a highly complex religious history, and a thorough knowledge of this complex history would help us make sense of the complexities of Kashmiri manuscript traditions. The extant corpus of birch bark codices have an importance akin to that of the Nag Hammadi codices or the Edfu codices from Coptic Egypt because they provide a crucial insight into the earliest spread of the Codex eastwards. I wanted to come back to our Fisher manuscript that started off my own journey to say that when we look at manuscripts like this and codices like this, we see that these uh, objects are deeply imbricated in conversations that have been happening, complex conversations, and each new idea or each new example that we find can deepen our understanding of these complex interactions that happen not just at the level of text but also at the level of technology and construction so hopefully that through further study of the development of the codex in Kashmir and all the changes made uh, by different craftspeople in the Kashmir Valley, we can begin to understand these complex interactions over centuries and over heart large swaths of Eurasia, at which Kashmir was a central and important node.